Olá! O nosso convidado de hoje para o Escoliose Talks Brasil 2020 é John Tunney. Ele é ortesista e protético e especialista em tratamento conservador da escoliose e deformidades da coluna vertebral. Ele trabalha com a East Coast Orthotic and Prosthetic Corp desde 2006 e seu primeiro trabalho foi tratar pacientes em um centro de trauma de nível 1, onde ele se interessou de forma verdadeira pela deformidade da coluna vertebral e escoliose. Ele já deu muitas palestras ao longo desses anos sobre tópicos como escoliose e o sistema de órtese para a escoliose, o RSC, que é o sistema Rigo-Xenô, entre outros. Nos últimos 10 anos, John se uniu ao corpo médico do Columbia University e se dedica a maior parte do tempo ao trabalho em pediatria e escoliose. Ele faz parte da equipe de cuidados conservadores, ou seja, tratamento conservador para escoliose, que agora é o seu cargo em tempo integral como diretor clínico do programa de coluna uh, de órteses e próteses da East Coast, do programa de tratamento conservador da coluna de órteses e próteses da East Coast. Então, vocês vão ver que esse Escoliose Talks também vai trazer muita informação importante para todos nós. Hi, John. We are very happy and grateful to have your presence in our Escoliose Talks Brazil 2020. Our awareness about scoliosis is becoming more and more necessary and the correct information is important, right? Sure. For the past 10 years, you teamed up with the physicians at the Columbia University Medical Center, with the majority of your work being in pediatrics and scoliosis. You are also a part of conservative care team for scoliosis, which is now your full-time role as the clinical director of East Coast Orthotic and Prosthetic Conservative Spine Program. Your knowledge and dedication to the treatment of scoliosis will certainly bring many benefits for us. Um, I don't know if you remember, John, when we met us in 2017 on gala dinner during the SOSOC meeting in Lyon, France. Um, in that meeting, you presented a lecture about sagittal plane. And a short time later, um, you came to, to make braces for our patients. Well, John, we will talk about bracing, uh, specifically 3D bracing for scoliosis. And my first, my first question for you is why 3D brace can be considered as the best option for idiopathic scoliosis? Um, I, I think the really simple and easy answer for that is scoliosis is a 3D deformity. So if you're only treating two of the dimensions, you're quite simply missing something. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a long time, the reason we didn't is we really didn't have a full understanding of what needed to be treated. Or for some reason we used to, when we used to make casts for people with scoliosis, you know, not me, but many years ago, they always treated in 3D and they always derotated and all of the early casts, even for younger kids are 3D casts. And then I think we tried to make everything a bit too modular um, and it, that lent itself to quote unquote 2D bracing. Yes, yes. And uh, it's so important now because uh, for many years, other, other bracing uh, were made in, well, good, good news, no? <laughs> and um, the, the next is, um, do you believe that it's easy, for, for easy, I mean simple, to acquire knowledge to produce a good quality 3D brace? And what is necessary? So I, I, I honestly think uh, finding the information 
is reasonably simple. Mm-hmm. Executing the plan is reasonably hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it takes lots of practice. I, I, I kind of think in scoliosis, we all know what we would like to do. Mm-hmm. It's just very hard to do it um, and yes. do it properly and do it well. And um, this is something where I think sometimes uh, the surgeons have a leg up on us. They can move individual vertebrae kind of how they wish. Um, we yeah. have to do everything in you know blocks and systems. You can't really isolate independent ribs in somebody's body. So um, a lot of it, uh, quite simply, there's a lot of trial and error and experience that goes into it. Things that you think would work don't always the first time. And then you continue to adapt uh, and change your treatment over time to get the best results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, the, the scoliosis per se is complex now. So, <laughs> yes. It, it, it's, one of, it's one of the few conditions where sometimes you, you think you've done everything absolutely perfect and it doesn't mean the outcome is perfect. And, and, yeah. that's, uh, and that's very hard for my own mental status sometimes, uh, thinking about what I've done wrong and sometimes it's nothing. Yes, it's true. Thank you. Um, usually, John, people think that uh, scoliosis creates curves in the spine to the sides. Some uh, know that there is also a rotation aspect, but what important does the sagittal aspect have in scoliosis? Um, I think we're really learning the answer to this question um, and it's evolving over time. Uh, right now, as I understand it, it's um, there were things that we were doing basically, quote unquote, wrong. Um, we were decreasing lots of lordosis in patients. We were pushing on their stomachs. Um, and, and we did this, I think, in part because we all like a straight line. It's very pleasing to us. It, it locked everything in. It made a very nice straight brace. And, and, and it was mm-hmm. probably easier to accomplish. And I think lastly, we all tried to do that because we thought we knew what to do. And I think we're finding out that every patient probably has something different that we need to do for them. So every patient probably has a different physical makeup that we need to adapt to. And that's really where the understanding is coming from now. And I won't tell you that I have the perfect answer to this, but I think we're starting to understand what we shouldn't do. And that's step one in the process. Um, and now we're going to try and figure out exactly what to do as far yes. as that goes. Yes. It's um, it's always a, a hard work, but uh, when, the, when we we reach a good, a good outcome, it's, it's always good, no? It's, uh, there's no better feeling than uh, telling a patient you don't ever have to see them again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's one, of, it's one of the weird times where you say that, and that everyone's very happy at that moment. Yes, and yes, it's so so good. Um, what can happen if do not take the sagittal aspects into account when producing a three D brace? Um, I, I think in like some of our early studies, we found that patients are more likely to progress. Mm-hmm. Um, if you like disrupt their sagittal profile and there's a measurement called uh, you know PI LL mismatch and it was something that um, that's been looked at in adults um, you know reasonably extensively uh, extensively and uh, they found if the mismatch was more than 10 degrees um, adults are much more likely to have pain so we so we started looking at that in patients and we don't have a full answer yet but it seems that if patients are mismatched in the brace by more than 10 degrees, they're more likely to progress. Mm -hmm. So as we talked about before, now I know that's what I want to do. Now it's like working with every individual patient to see like how we can achieve that Um, and and taking in their profile, shape, construct into account as we kind of make the braces individually. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, John, for you work inside a big hospital in New York now. Do you believe that daily monitoring patients with scoliosis 
who need the brace makes a difference as a professional? Um, it, it's been probably the biggest change of my career um, is putting monitors in patients' braces. And, and I never would have thought that would have been the case. Um, it just makes for a such more honest, realistic discussion when a patient comes into the office and the initial reaction from the patients is, oh man, you're gonna be watching me. But I also think it puts the onus on us as well because if the patients are doing what we ask of them and what is prescribed and it's not working, well, I, I turn that monitor back on myself and I say like, what do I have to do to fix it? Because they're doing what they're supposed to. And I think it's just another level of accountability. Um, we did this study 10 years ago when the monitors were huge and we used to have to hide them inside of pads and braces. And we even had a patient uh, go to the airport without knowing their monitor was in their brace because they gave us an IRB a long time ago to not tell patients that we were monitoring them. And what happened was once we told them, they wore the brace on average four more hours a day just by telling them we were watching them. And yeah. I think we all kind of understand that time is probably the biggest uh, factor in bracing. The more you wear it, the better it works, kind of, without question. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, for three years, many of the patients at our Scoliosis Institute went to New York to be cared for by you. And what different aspects did you find in our patients that were different from your order? What difference did you find? The single biggest difference is they all had done physical therapy before I made them a brace. Yeah. And that is a huge difference to how it operates here in the States. Um, Almost always the brace comes first and then I'm the one or the doctor is the one getting them to physical therapy after the fact. Mm -hmm. I think all the patients accept the brace better if they've done therapy first. I think they understand how the brace works better if they've done therapy first. And it's just as much simpler conversation. I think the on-ramp to wearing it is easier as well. That, that, that's the biggest difference. I, I think kids okay. are kids, scoliosis is scoliosis, but like what, yeah. how they're treated is, is very different. Yeah. Yeah, it's so so good and so so good for us this this experience so important, John. Thank you. Um, how do you see the opportunity that the our institute and and our project Scoliosis Brazil can offer to NYRC Brace now here in Brazil? Yeah, I mean it, it's just an opportunity to see more patients you know at the end of the day like i like to think i'm pretty good at doing this but i obviously can't see every patient in the world <laughs> and i think we all kind of feel that way we wish we could treat everybody all the time and, th and there has to be like some sort of dissemination of knowledge um, throughout the world so everybody gets better treatment and mm -hmm. we can probably argue till the end of time what the <laughs> what the best way to go about it is but i think yes. just having more people um, more well-trained um, in more places is kind of the answer, period. Yes, yes, is this. John, um, I don't know if it's possible for you um, tell us how uh, can we know uh, when use all the brace other other kind of braces in in scoliosis yeah i think um you know you you always have options right and it's uh, as we go to so sort every year i'm always shocked by the, the many types of braces that are out there and, and clearly mm -hmm. there is not one right answer so i think um for patients who are doing you know um physical therapy with, with the brace, sometimes you kind of have to match the therapy to the, the brace type. You know, there, there's concepts that kind of integrate themselves. You know, um, you know, I, I, I trained with, you know, Dr. Rigo and, and the, you know, the Schroth concept and, the, and those two things marry themselves very nicely together. Um, what the therapist is trying to teach the patient is also what the brace is trying to do. 
and there are other ways to do it, but I think you kind of just need to pick one plan um, and, and follow that path uh, to the best of your knowledge, because I don't think any one of us knows in particular for this exact curve pattern, for this exact patient, that a different brace type would, would work differently in different patients. Yes. If that yes. makes sense. Thank you. So, uh, um, what 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 do you what do you think that that doctors um, is still um, still recommend the, the the Milwaukee brace, John? Um, I have not made a Milwaukee brace in fifteen years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, where I am, it is basically gone. Uh, my first year ever working was the last time I made one. Um, quite honestly, I think I think in some ways uh, uh, a Chano type brace is more similar to a Milwaukee um, than it is to like a Boston style. You know, by the um, the open space and the ability to breathe in it. Um, I, I just don't think patients tolerate it quite honestly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've never seen a patient wear it as instructed ever in my entire mm -hmm. career. <laughs> yes, so I almost, I, I almost don't view it as an option um, anymore yes. because nobody would do it even if I thought it was the right thing. And I think that's yeah. probably the biggest difference. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Thank you. Because um, unfortunately here in Brazil, Milwaukee is so, so so useful, so so common, and so then uh, recommended. Then um, it's important. No? I also think um, they're hard to make. <laughs> mm. it, it's, a, it's a set of skills that I, I don't even think I have with the way you have to bend the metal these days, and it's just not how <laughs> yeah. we operate. Like we're we're moving towards things like three D printing and and carving with robots, and you yeah. know, like it's a very different environment. Um, it's hard to do them well. It's hard to find somebody who does them well. I, I almost think it's harder. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It, it's, it's harder to make, and you have patients that don't like them. Um, that doesn't sound like a great combination. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, you, you, you have a message, John, to, to the doctors, or to the people here in Brazil um, about scoliosis? Uh, I think the biggest message I have to people everywhere is I think we kind of need to change a little bit our thoughts about scoliosis. I think we need to think of the brace as a prevention technique as opposed to a treatment necessarily. I think uh, in these times of COVID, we all would love some prevention much more than we would love some treatment. And I think if you can you know, avoid the bad situations altogether, you'll be much more successful. Um, yeah. Here, we're treating patients much earlier than we used to. Yeah. And we're finding that if we treat them earlier, they never get to the bad situations. You know, all the studies kind of tell us that, you know, 25, 30 degrees, now these curves are much more at risk. Well, why wouldn't we try to stop them from getting to 25 and 30 degrees where they're much more at risk? Yeah. Um, and I think the patients actually like those better too. And I think you could probably also do it with a little bit less dose. So we're, we're treating patients who are in this like 15 to 25 degree range and we're only treating them 12 hours a day. And we're having really high levels of success, having less impact, I think, on the psychosocial aspects of scoliosis, not taking away the things that the kids really, um, generally speaking, fight about. Um, and we're still very successful. I, I, I think that's probably the future. Yes. Um, John, um, I just want to... Uh, I just want to, to do a last question for you, sure. John. Um, do you... What uh, do you think that, that the treatment in the in USA is, is changing about scoliosis? Of course, is changing or was changing um, in in the last years? In the I I mean it's changed dramatically in the last you know six seven years for sure. So I guess about half my career, um, mm. 
I mean, as, as you look behind me, we see, uh, you know, therapy bars on the wall. I'm in a New York City hospital where it's very expensive per square foot <laughs> to have space. And when we first met our first, you know, therapist for scoliosis, we went to a talk. Quite honestly, we almost laughed at them. <laughs> it, it's, like, it's a simple way. We were like, come on, there's no way. This, this breathing exercises, what are you talking about? And we, we just never really gave it any thought. And, and now here I am sitting in a hospital at a major Ivy League institution that has a room just for physical therapy and bracing. Uh, yeah. and, and that that's in less than a decade. Almost everything has changed. Um, and I think it's probably for the better. I think we all are slowly moving more towards um, a little bit more prevention as opposed to only treatment. Yeah, good. Good, good to know <laughs> and good to hear your, your words. Slowly, so good. slowly, not, not, nothing, nothing very quick, but slowly. Yeah, I know, so, so slowly, yes, and um, for sure. Well, John, uh, for this this end, um, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for being in this time with us at uh, Scoliosis Talks today. Uh, you have made clear the commitment and dedication that is needed to treat scoliosis now. For sure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me. I hope everyone stays safe and uh, yeah. hopefully we'll be able to uh, meet again in person one time again soon. Yeah. Well, stay safe too. Thank you very Bye, much. Bye, John. Thank you. Bye.